from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good evening, everyone. I feel like I'm the Library of Congress. Library of Congress's token nerd to do all these welcomes when it comes to our superhero events. But good evening. On behalf of the Librarian of Congress, Carla Hayden, I am Roswell Encina, the Chief Communications Officer, and welcome to the Library of Congress. We're here to celebrate a very special birthday. This May, we are celebrating the 80th anniversary of the Madam, Man of Steel himself, Superman. Yep. You can clap. In 80 years, he has rescued Lois Lane countless of times, saved the universe from Lex Luthor, Brainiac, and Doomsday more than I can remember, has died, returned, and has been reborn. Soups is part of the American fabric as much as apple pie and baseball. And just look at the set. I mean, we've outdid ourselves tonight. I remember the first time my parents bought me my first batch of DC comic books. It included issues of the Batman family, the Justice League of America, and of course, action comics featuring Superman. As a kid, as most of you know, you were either a DC reader or a Marvel reader. Um, there's Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Aquaman, The Flash, Green Arrow, Green Lantern, Adam, Robin, I could go on and on, but as far as I'm concerned, my loyalty was with anyone Superman was friends with. I remember watching reruns of old episodes of The Adventures of Superman with starring George Reeves. I practically memorized every episode of the cartoon animated series Super Friends. And um, so when the first ever superhero blockbuster movie, Superman, starring Christopher Reeve, came out, I was flying high just like the Man of Steel himself. Since then, I've, I think I've seen every version of Superman on the small and big screen, from Smallville to Supergirl. From Christopher Reeve to Henry Cavill, it's safe to say I've grown up with Superman and clearly drank the DC Comics Kool-Aid. And working here at the Library of Congress has really brought me to a new level of my superhero nerdiness. Um, the Library of Congress, if you don't know, has one of the largest comic book collections in the world. In the world. I mean, so. And just to give you a little preview on your way out, right outside the, um, the auditorium here, you'll see a little bit of the library's collection, including some S Superman comic books that date back to the 40s. So I know you'll have fun with that. And yes, the library has the first draft of the Declaration of Independence, uh, Lincoln's draft of the Gettysburg Address, Washington's inaugural address, a book by Galileo, a lock of Beethoven's hair, and Alexander Hamilton's papers. But on my first day here at the library, the only thing I wanted to see was our first edition of Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman. <laughs> so the Librarian of Congress, Carla Hayden, has promised to make the library's collection more accessible to the public. Last year, we had our very first pop-up exhibit of these comic books, including a special event with Linda Carter in, co in collaboration with Amos Awesome Con here in DC. This year, we are excited to do it again. As Washington hosts AwesomeCon 2018 this weekend, the Library of Congress wants to bring DC to DC to celebrate the Man of Steel's 80th birthday. We have some special guests for you tonight. We have Paul Levitz, the former publisher and president of DC Comics, who led the DC Comics division of Time Warner as its senior business officer for three decades. During that time, he was intimately involved in growing the company into a cultural force with media successes as diverse with one of the highest grossing comic book films ever, The Dark Knight, and the longest running comic book television series, Smallville. Also joining us is comic book writer and artist Dan Jurgens. He is the force behind a 10 year run as writer artist of Superman, including the best selling Death of Superman, for which he won the National Cartoonist Society Award for Best in Comic Book Division. Moderating tonight, is David Bencourt, who is a writer for the Washington Post, whose Twitter handle is, of course, at a, at a DC fanboy. He also writes about all aspects of comic book culture for the Post Comic Riffs blog. So let's give them a big DC welcome. As they say, it's a bird, it's a plane. We're all about Superman tonight. 
Please welcome Paul Levitz, Dan Jurgens, and David Benincourt. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for, for being here tonight. Uh, as a native Washingtonian and a huge comic book fan, this is a very special night uh, for me. Uh, my dad's in the audience somewhere, and we're both big fanboys. It's a very cool moment, uh, especially for the character we're going to talk about. Uh, Superman, you know, who goes by many names, the Man of Steel, last son of Krypton, uh, Kal-El, Clark Joseph Kent. He's, he goes by a lot of things, but this is the character this current era that we're seeing where comic book culture has taken over so much of the entertainment industry. You know, we find it in live action television, movies, animation, you name it. Uh, that all gets to start because of the creation of this character that we're going to talk about today. Um, very honored to be here beside uh, Paul Levitz, former editor, I'm sorry, former president and publisher of DC Comics, and Dan Jurgens, a writer and artist who probably is most known for being the man that killed Superman. I remember <laughs> fondly being 12 years old and reading that issue, that last panel where Lois is holding him and you know she basically realizes he's mm -hmm. gone. Uh, seems like it was yesterday. Uh, it wasn't. It was actually a long time ago. Um, but it's great to have you guys here. Thank you for, thank you for joining. Nice to be here. Nice to be here. Uh, Paul, I want to start with you. Uh, do you think it says something about the continued relevance of Superman that a series created so long ago is not only still around, but has managed to reach uh, in the comic book industry in terms of publishing a very iconic 1,000th issue. You know, there's very little that was culturally relevant in 1938 that's still culturally relevant today. There are a few things that we look back on as sort of wonderful artifacts of the time. The Judy Garland Wizard of Oz movie is about a minute after that. but. Here's something that was created then that is still a living, growing, changing part of the culture. Uh, Dan's writing it again. New movies are being made, new television series. Krypton started a week ago, looking at a different aspect of the character's life. That's an extraordinary thing in a culture that has the attention span of a mayfly. Um, and We've seen through those 80 years that we're being distracted constantly by the new, the exciting. You have so many thousands of opportunities to find new things, whether it's new television shows, new, new comic series, new little self-published books that turn into Fifty Shades of Grey. Um, to have something be consistently important to the culture through all that time is just an absolutely unique phenomenon. Dan, what's it like for you uh, to be a part of the Action Comics legacy now? A lot of us, uh, I know from my youth, I remember you and your time on the Superman title. Um, but you're currently writing Action Comics right now. Uh, mm -hmm. Your run will be coming to an end with the a standalone story you've got in issue 1000, but you've been kind of leading the march of Action Comics to that 1000th issue. Uh, back when you guys were doing Superman in the 90s, uh, the death of uh, that was around the time where Action was hovering around 700 issues, Action sure, Comics. Right. Uh, could you have imagined back then in the early 90s that you'd be here in 2018 no. talking about the 1000th issue? No, there's no way. I, I mean, so much of it is when you're involved with trying to produce story, you are trying to produce story, and it's just trying to fashion a good story to get it done, to, to see it get to the point where it's printed and on the stands. And, and as a writer, often you build story in terms of arc. So you're planning five, eight, you know, 10 or 12 issues ahead. You certainly, at least I'm not, and I don't know anybody who is, thinking 20 years down the road or 30. And the, the comic book numbering system if we go back to that time, it just seems so far off. It's like, no, we never talked about Action 1000, nor did I think we ever really gave it any thought. I'll say I very nerdily gave it some thought. Okay. I, <laughs> I actually remember buying Action Comics 700 and trying to calculate and 
course, I ended up being a writer, so math wasn't a strong point. But right. I do remember trying to think, wow, what year will 1,000 come out? So, Are you close? Were you, did you have it? Uh, I, I was off by a little bit. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, as a former publisher and president of uh, DC Comics, what do you think of the notion that some say that Superman is too powerful a character and maybe too hard to craft stories because of that? Uh, is the key to a good Superman story a villain just as powerful like Doomsday or Darkseid? Or is part of what makes people keep coming back to Superman is the fact that he has a human side, uh, having grown up in Kansas, being very down to earth despite being so powerful? To me, the strongest part of Superman has always been the emotional part and sort of his representation as an iconic moral figure. That this is someone who has these incredible gifts and is using them for the right causes. Uh, some years ago, we had a group of Arab editorial cartoonists come to visit DC. Mostly they wanted to see the Mad Magazine guys and say, uh, they don't put you in jail for doing this? <laughs> um, but they made the point, they said, isn't the superhero idea a reflection of the American belief that might makes right? And I thought about it for a moment or two, and I said, well, I can see where you see that in the superheroes, but I don't think that's the case. I think what the superheroes, and in certainly in particular Superman, says to us is that we're all born with certain gifts, and it's what we do with them, how we choose to use them, that determines how the world grows, how the world changes, and who we are. And I think those are the great stories. You see Superman using his power in a way that changes an individual person's life. Dan, I saved a very serious question for you. Oh. Um, the, the trunks. The trunks. Oh, I knew that was coming. <laughs> <laughs> as, yes. someone, as someone who has not only written Superman, but illustrated Superman as well. Uh, now, I, remem I remember New 52, the trunks go away. It was kind of you know, aligned with Henry Cavill's debut mm -hmm. as the Man of Steel. And, that, and, and in a way, that kind of makes sense, because you may have young kids discovering this character for the first time. And if they want to jump to the comics, you want it to look as similar as possible. But it was a, lot of, it was a right. contra controversial decision. Um, one of the biggest things celebrated with Action 1000 both this uh, 80th anniversary edition and your periodical edition, is the fact that the trunks are back. Now, as someone who's drawn Superman, and you've been drawing him trunkless in action <laughs> leading up to this point. Yeah, careful how you phrase that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, come on. Trunkless with the suit still on. Uh, did, did you ever have muscle memory moments when you were drawing him fully clothed with, without the trunks? All the time. If you were to see the underdrawing that was there, and, uh, because the way I work is, first I sketch things out, they're always there. They, they were always there, and it's because, um, some people might say it's because I drew so much of Superman when he had them. Others might say it's because it just fits well, uh, the appearance of the character. And what I've always said is, uh, a couple of things. One, we always saw the trunks as part of the uniform, as though it was all one piece and not necessarily something he put on the outside. But the other part of it was, I think it's the yellow belt. And uh, even when they went without the trunks, we played around with like a yellow S shield for a belt buckle or some way to get a little yellow in that mid-range part of the uniform because that helped to highlight that brilliant triangular shield with the mm. S in it. And ultimately, I think that's why the trunks are needed, is more because of the yellow belt, because that pulls the whole uniform together for me. Paul, what are your thoughts on the trunks? Would you, have got, would you have gone with that decision? I'm a pro-trunks guy <laughs> in all of this. Um, they, I duly, please duly note that the trunks did not disappear until after I was away from the executive <laughs> desk. Um, and if we go off the mic later, I can tell you who got the trunks off, and it's not who you think. <laughs> and, and, and the trunks are back. Do have a hashtag now. It is hashtag the trunks are back, right? <laughs> there you go. It's <laughs> trending for sure. Uh, Paul, can, in, in this edition that you've edited, the 80th anniversary edition, um, you worked with Marv Wolfman on this incredible story of an unpublished Siegel and Schuster work uh, with Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, the creators of Superman. Could you talk about what it was like uh, first finding out about that and then working with it? Well, 
the guys at DC asked me to put together this celebratory hardcover and gave me some tools to work with that they don't usually offer editors of reprint titles. So I was able to reach out to a number of unusual people to add their comments and their thoughts, which was great fun. Uh, there's a piece in here by Laura Siegel Larson, Jerry Siegel's daughter, talking about her dad and his memories of creation of Superman and his attitudes towards it. That was a really wonderful thing for me because it's no secret that there were many years of legal battles between Siegel and Schuster and the families and DC that have got, gotten peacefully and happily resolved at this point. And really to be able to have Laura in here was a way of closure in some fashion. J Jules Pfeiffer, who's really an American treasure, one of the few people who's won a Pulitzer, an Oscar, an Obie, I think every, everything but the lottery. Um, and he's able to contribute his memories of Action One as a kid who bought them and went on to be this great cartoonist in his own right. Um, but as I was assembling the book, I remembered that Marv Wolfman, who's a dear friend of many, many years, had salvaged a Siegel and Schuster story that DC was going to throw out unpublished when he was a kid. In the old days when you came up to the DC offices, original art wasn't perceived to be worth anything. I'm sorry, Dan. <laughs> Though this is before any of it was I yours. Know, I know, yep. And they would, you know, like it was trick or treat. Um, here, little boy, you came up for a tour. Would you like a pa page of art? The artists themselves couldn't get their artwork back because they were presumed that they would somehow go sell it to somebody else to be published. I'm not quite sure how that was supposed to work. Um, but if you were a kid touring, you could get it. And Marv, on one occasion, salvaged the story that was about to be destroyed. And he had had it in his house. And I spoke to him and said, so the story that you've had hidden away all these years, would you mind having it published? Will that, do you think that will decrease the value of it? Uh, or increase the value of it. You want to check that with an art dealer before we go ahead. Um, and he said, no, no, I'm you know, happy to have it published, happy to tell the story of how I saved Superman, is how he phrased it in his text piece here. Um, it's not an extraordinary story in being like the great classic Superman story. There's a reason they weren't about to publish it that day. Um, but it's a magnificent artifact to be able to see sort of the work in progress. And it's pretty close to the end of Jerry's writing of Superman, um, pretty close to the end of when the Schuster studio was creating the material. And you really see what the process was like. And we reproduced that in black and white, so it doesn't have the advantages and the masking of color on top of it. So it feels much more like an artifact, kind of fun. Dan, your run on Action Comics comes to an end uh, with the 1,000th issue mm -hmm. that'll be out in April. Um, For now. He's come <laughs> back before. For now. That's yeah, true. Very true. Uh, was returning to Superman in this new era of comics what you thought it would be? Uh, how, how, how did you feel wrapping up this current storyline in Action Comics? And uh, we, we, most of us know here, uh, Brian Michael Bendis is going to be taking over with mm -hmm. 1001. Um, are you excited for that? Yeah, definitely. I've talked to Brian a little bit about what he has in store, and I think it's going to be good. I look forward to it as a reader. Uh, as for winding it up, I think that to come back to it a couple of years ago and be able to write it as a book that was coming out twice a month was a lot of fun because at that point you can play around with storytelling technique a little bit. Um, normally what you have to do is put an issue out there and anticipate someone remembering what you were talking about 30 days later. And when you had a book that came out twice a month, you could play around with some ideas a little more and you could dig a little deeper in some things just knowing that uh, readers would have a more fresh memory of what you just did. So it was nice to be able to do it that way. We've been talking about Superman this whole time. Let's talk about Clark Kent mm -hmm. for a second. Uh, there's this notion that pops up every now and then that uh, Clark Kent is just who Superman pretends to be when he wants to not be bothered. Um, obviously, that's not the opinion of a, your hardcore fanboy. We all know that's right. not the case. <laughs> um, in the comics, uh, 
you know, he's Clark from the moment he lands in Kansas in the Kryptonian ship. When crafting stories for Superman, this is a question for both of you, uh, is it important to remember the man he was, Clark Kent, who was around long before anyone ever started calling him Superman? I think so. I mean, I, I have always seen that as the core of who Superman really is, that uh, this, this gets into the whole idea of people sometimes ask, you know, is he Superman first or is he Clark Kent first? And I'm not sure you differentiate between the two. Um, he is Clark Kent, and in a lot of ways, what he does as Clark Kent, or, you know, and it's the same for Lois Lane, is they're trying to make the world a better place in what they do through their jobs, through their careers. And I think there's a reason he chose that for a career. And by the same way of thinking, I think then being Superman is sort of an extension of that intent. So it's, it's no different in some ways than if your na next door neighbor was a police officer or firefighter. They're not two different people. It is, this is what I do when I'm at home, and this is what I do when I go do this other thing. That's how I've always seen it. And I think the other piece where Clark is important is in some ways Clark is representative of us. Yes. You know, we, we have the insecurities of being Clark, and we wish that our loved ones would use their vision to see through those insecurities to our good qualities. I think that's really a fundamental part of the Superman myth. Jerry very much put himself into the character that way, and I think he captured something that's in all of us. We all have those kinds of insecure moments. Kind of, <clears throat> whenever I think about that, I think about uh, this issue right here of Man of Steel, a fantastic miniseries mm -hmm. written and drawn by the legendary John Byrne. Um, I remember there was a scene in there where one of his parents, I can't remember if it was Ma or Pa, but they said to Superman, you know, because you're not wearing a mask, people aren't going to think you have anything to hide. Mm -hmm. So don't worry about the fact that, yes, even when you put the glasses on, you still look exactly the same because no one's going to be thinking Superman is trying to hide because his face is out in the open. Right. I thought that was great. Uh, another question I have for both of you is, and you're very familiar with this, Dan, Superman has a son now mm -hmm. uh, with Lois Lane, Jonathan Kent, who is currently Superboy. Legacy characters like Superman, uh, for a long time, children were never really in the qu equation when it comes to continuity. Uh, what are your thoughts on Superman being a father? And yes, I do know Batman has a kid now, and it's Damien <laughs> before. Hey, what about Batman? Um, what are your thoughts on Superman being a father uh, as someone who has been part of telling Jonathan's story. Uh, and Paul, as someone who is from an era where that might not have been tried, what do you think about that? Um, as the years go on, the continuities get more complex and there's more room to do different kinds of stories. The Superman of my time hadn't gotten to the point of having kids. There were lots of imaginary stories that I read when I was a child that imagined what it would be like when Superman might have children. Some of those were really fun when I was seven, eight, nine years old. Um, so I can certainly imagine that the stories today are fun for people to read. It's not my moment. You know, we get frozen in the characters as we love them best. And when I want the character as I loved him best, I go back to the stuff I was reading when I was 10 or 12. It doesn't make it better than what's being done now, just it reminds me of what candy store I was in when I found that issue or where I was at camp and reacting to it. Uh, I think that's part of the, the power of the comic book form. So I'm going to stick to sort of my memories as the heart and soul of it and not, not pass judgment for good or for ill on what's being done for a later generation. Years ago when uh, Clark and Lois finally got engaged and then got married, we, we talked a little bit about would we ever do stories where they become parents. And we said, well, it took him 50 years to get married, so 50 years from now, <laughs> we'll get to it. I think with this one, the idea was that it allows us to tell a little bit of a different kind of a story with Superman. That 
if, if Superman is out there serving in terms of a beacon of hope and inspiration and, and subtly trying to guide those around him, would it be fun to do stories where we see him trying to do that as a parent? Is there some kind of duality there? Because ideally, as a parent, you're trying to do the exact same thing, right? You're trying to set an example, set a standard, and hope that people follow you. So I, I know when we first talked about it, I said, in a way, this can kind of represent some of that. It can kind of represent something of the future. Um, and I think there are new stories to tell with it. So that's why we went ahead and did it. I, I've had great fun with it. I think it's worked well. You enjoy writing in, with Jonathan? I enjoy writing for Jonathan because I think two things happened. There was a fear that Superman would instantly seem old and stodgy. And I think there is always this fear about Superman seeming old and stodgy anyway. So I said, well, let's embrace it and make the best of it while at the same time having that fun sense of youth, which I think is John. It's just a different version of Superboy in a way. It's a Superboy for the now. Can you guys talk about, uh, there are two different versions of Action 1000. One, the celebratory uh, commemorative edition that you've put together, and also the periodical, which you've been writing for the last few years. Mm -hmm. um, could you talk about the difference between the two and what it was like uh, working on them for both of you? Sure. Um, you know, I think Dan had the, f Dan had the um, more classic opportunity in the sense that he, he was getting to do Action 1000. <laughs> then that issue comes out and it's got his name on it and that's, that's seriously cool. What I got to do was to be a historian, be someone who could use knowledge of how the character had evolved, use knowledge of who the people were who would have interesting things to say about the character and bring them together for that celebration. I got to throw the party to celebrate what he was doing. Um, it was a great party. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I mean, we got some pretty cool people yes. at the party. Yeah. And they looked back and they put the pieces together and we examined the different eras and represented the, the different things in context. And it's, it's terrific to be able to do that kind of celebration. Um, I'm utterly jealous of actually getting, getting, to, getting to do the story itself. But it's great just to be able to throw the party. And Dan, for you, uh, with the 1000s, your run more or less wrapped itself up with not, issue 999. Mm -hmm. um, but getting to that 1000th issue, which has many contributors, what, what did you say to yourself, OK, I've, I've got one little piece of this historic comic uh, something that's never happened before, a comic reaching a thousand issues. Uh, what did you say to yourself you wanted to put in your story? I think I wanted to find a way to say thank you in a way. Mm -hmm. um, way back when, when my kids were really little, I used to, I, I taught them to say something which is basically went this way. I'd say, what is Superman's greatest power? And I'd get them to say, he pays the mortgage. <laughs> uh, so I, I have always felt that having had an association with a character like Superman that long, um, that I started to think along the lines of, you know, how do you say thank you? And, and in my story, it's really what Metropolis does, is their way of thinking Superman. You know, you can't go out and buy him a new car or give him a Caribbean vacation. You know, it's, it's, I wanted to write something from the heart and express that through the citizens of Metropolis, and that's what I was going for, because Action 1000 really is an iconic issue. And the stories I've read in it, I think, are just tremendous. And it's been great fun to see it come together. I think it really is a very special book. What does the number 1000 mean to both of you? Because we're in a really different era in the comic book industry where things keep refreshing. And number one issue, that's the big thing now, to have a new number one issue to start over. Um, I remember once talking to Todd McFarlane, and he told, who, a uh, former DC Marvel artist, creator of Spawn, uh, and he once told me he, thought, he never thought that his Spawn comic would be one of the highest numbered comics in the industry, just because of the way things have changed. Even sure. uh, when New 52 came out and DC t went to total new numbering. Uh, does the number 1,000, because it's never happened before in comics, 
does it have a special significance? What does it mean to you guys? You know, I was a comic book collector before I was a comic book professional. And to be able to have a 100-issue run of anything was an extraordinary thing in those days. There were very few comics, a dozen, two dozen maybe, that had had runs where you could have a 100-issue run that you could possibly collect. The idea that there's something you could have a 1,000 issues in a row of just is utterly unimaginable to that inner, inner kid in me. And I think it's incredibly exciting. I'd also add that when I was a kid, and I'd be at a general newsstand, and this is before comic shop, so it's just general newsstand, and I could hold up an, an issue of, say, you know, Spider-Man 63 and Batman, I don't know, 215, say. I just figured anything that made it to 200 issues must be better. I thought the higher number <laughs> meant more quality. I really did. So 1,000 must be pretty good. <laughs> uh, Dan, <clears throat> I hate to keep bringing this back to the death of Superman, but that, a huge reason of why I'm here on this stage right now is because of how much that storyline impacted me in terms of not just being a kid who went to 7-Eleven and grabbed the comic because he wanted to draw stuff, but actually wanted to read a continuing story. Um, that, if you would have asked me, there's one comic book moment that would probably never be adapted to live action film, I would say it was killing Superman. Mm -hmm. uh, but we actually got to see it happen in, whether you liked it or not, Batman vs Superman, Dawn of Justice. Now. I remember, because I, I like to pride myself on thinking I can figure out what's going to happen in a movie, because I read the books. I know what happens. Um, but even when they showed Doomsday in the trailer, I said, oh, that's cool, but they're not going to kill him. And they did it. Mm -hmm. So when that happened, did you kind of think to yourself and say, wow, I, I wasn't expecting that to ever be adapted into a movie? I think in the back of my head, because right away there were there was uh, both a novelization, they also did audiobooks of it that I thought we would eventually get there. And especially because it had come up earlier, anyway, with the Tim Burton film. And, you know, then they did it as an animated movie, so I thought, yeah, we might just get there at some point. So what was, it, it was cool to see it done, but I think what really hit me as I was sitting in the movie was this notion that not only did they use doomsday or the story material or the story idea but they actually tried to replicate some of the stuff that i had drawn on film and mm -hmm. that was a very different experience because that i hadn't really seen before and and to see them try and reproduce something on film that i had drawn almost like verbatim a little bit was that that was that was a thrill it's got to be cool yep for the record the only thing i was upset about is that he didn't come back in the black suit that's what i <laughs> me too <laughs> You know, because Henry Cavill had tweeted out the image yep. of the black, so it's like, oh, they're going to do the black. No, I'm black with you. I'm with you. I'm so, sorry, I'm just venting. <laughs> Wait for the remake. There, there we go. Yeah. There we go. Uh, can you guys tell us about your first, can you, can you remember your first experience with this character when you first discovered him? I think it was watching the George Reeves shows on the little black and white TV at home. Um, the comic comes into my life, like most comics, in boxes that older kids on the block had of their, their comics, and I'd see all the different characters. But the first comic that was mine was Action 300, which uh, Babysitter brought to shut me up one night when I was about five years old. And it had a subscription ad where for a dollar you could get a subscription for a year, and I somehow conned my parents into sending in the dollar for it. And I was a subscriber to Action for a couple of years after that. Talk about a dollar well spent. <laughs> uh, it, it sort of paid off, ultimately. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> the first comic I ever bought was a Superman comic. It was Superman 189. It had Superman standing on the left side of the cover, and Crypto was barking at him and not wearing the cape. Crypto the dog did not have his cape on. And Superman is saying, or thinking, because they did thought balloons in those days, said, you know, even my dog Crypto doesn't recognize me. Uh, which, you know, if you're a kid, all right, I'll buy that. Let's, let's see what's going on. So my first comic was a Superman comic. Okay. Uh, for the record, my first was when he revealed his identity to Lois. 
which was an action comics issue. And you know mm -hmm. that which uh, is in here. Yeah. yeah. And that was a that was a point of some discussion because when that story was originally planned and we had a group of writers in the room that talked about it and set it up, that wasn't supposed to happen. That mm -hmm. they were going to get engaged and then in the middle of putting the story together, uh, a couple of the guys called me up uh, along with our editor at the time, Mike Carlin, and said, you know, we just realized if Superman proposes to Lois Lane and she says yes, and he doesn't admit that he's, that Clark can't admit that he's Superman, he's lying to her and that would be wrong. So we talked about <laughs> it all at the time, and that's how we kind of uh, reconfigured that scene. So it did play out that way. Um, we have a little bit of time. Are we going to leave time for a Q&A with the audience? Okay. Um, I'll do it. Okay. There you go, sir. And then I'll get you in the back. Go ahead. The mic is coming. That's what I was looking for. So when I was reading comics as a kid, I thought they were geared for kids. Um, I thought they were geared for the seven-year-old. Um, these comics these days don't seem to be geared for that audience. How, how do you keep kids in it to get more people turning into the industry uh, to, as readers? You know, that was a gigantic business question in the 1980s when the comic shop became the, the new home of the of the field and the newsstand was drying up. Because prior to the 1980s, in America, if you were a kid, comics were the first thing you bought other than maybe chewing gum. And you progressed from reading Disney or Looney Tunes on up to getting to the superheroes. And then you discovered the opposite sex or sports or something, and you gave, you gave it up and you moved on. The model changed. And for a few years there, we were petrified that we're never going to have new kids because we don't have the newsstands to recruit them with. Turned out that, in fact, you can recruit people to start reading comics at a later age. And starting in the late 80s and very heavily through the 90s, we began to see waves of kids coming into the medium in high school and in college years with the material that we were doing for older people. In the last 10 years, there's been a wonderful resurgence in comics for kids. The most successful graphic novel of the last few years is the work of Raina Telgemeier, which clearly reaches probably at its heart, eight to 10 year olds, and goes out at print runs larger than, sadly, any issue of Superman. Um, and those are kids who are coming into comics through that. Not all of them are gonna be interested in Superman afterwards, but some of them will be. Some of them will move through it. And I'm really comfortable at this point that we're, we're recruiting a lot of new people of all ages to come into comics and they're just coming in through very diverse paths, not the same exact path that my generation came in. It's a different time. One of the things I see that has definitely increased over the years is um, when, it's very often I'll hear someone your age, David, say, this was my first comic and it was a standard comic. And what I see more and more now is someone will put down a trade paperback in front of me and say, this was my first comic. And one of the barriers that I think was always there was this idea that they couldn't necessarily get the, that seven-year-old, couldn't get the entire story in an issue because it might be part three of a six-part story. Now when they put down that trade paperback, they've got the whole story. And that's, that's what I see more and more. It, they're giving me a book. DC also has a great gateway in the Teen Titans Go cartoon. Yes. Which I think is a phenomenal way to get young kids interested in some pretty cool yeah. characters. Next question, uh, right here. Uh, good. good evening, oh, there we go. Uh, just wanna start off by saying thank you to you both for taking the time to do this. I think it's a 
uh, very cool, and I'm sure everyone in the audience appreciates that you took the time to do it, so thank you to you both. Um, the question I have is, uh, it's actually about Lex Luthor, um, and it kind of ties back into an earlier question that was brought up about the thought process that, you know, Superman is too powerful, there's, that's, he's boring because there's no threat to him, but when you, and especially when I th make the comparison to the modern day interpretation of Lex versus the films, you know, when I'm reading of Lex in the modern day comic books, he's, you know, one of the best that humanity has to offer in the intellect, the prowess, the will. And that's why Superman takes him so seriously because he recognizes that and he knows that this guy is committed to taking him down. But then when I look at the films, even going back to, you know, Superman the movie, there's an element of kind of over the topness and hamminess that's the Lex Luthor character is portrayed, and I think it's kind of hard narratively to portray that to the audience and ask them to think that that's a character that Superman will take seriously as a threat. Because unlike the Joker, where his over the topness plays into the you know, psychot the psychotic nature of him and makes it more threatening, I think that doesn't necessarily play with the character of Lex Luthor in regards to his relationship with Superman. So I'm just wondering why you think that element um, keeps making its way into the films and not necessarily taking the cues from the modern day interpretation of Lex Luthor. I think in some ways, you know, Lex might have been chosen for the film and portrayed those ways because he was familiar. Um, but to backtrack a little bit on your question, which is, um, is it hard to write for Superman because of the power level, and especially with regards to Lex Luthor because he doesn't have that uh, level of power, I think you, you write a good story by testing character, and, and that's what you find out with a Superman story, and I don't find that hard to write for. You test Superman's character somehow, and if you take someone like Superman, or, uh, Lex Luthor, who is so devious and intelligent and crafty, there should be many ways for him to test Superman somehow. It even means if Superman goes and stands inside Lex's office where he could you know, use his x-ray vision to look at any file or data or listen to any conversation, that none of that appears in the office because Lex is too smart. So there are always good ways to do that kind of a story. And I think the fact that Lex doesn't have superpowers when pitted against Superman is part of what makes that dynamic so interesting. And I recall that one of the, I think maybe the best explanations I ever saw was, I think it was a Justice League comic, forgive me, I don't know the exact one, but a character was asking Superman, like, why are you so worried about him? You can see him, you can hear, you can, and he goes, well, I can't see what he's thinking. Yeah. And he's always thinking. Um, and so I just, the serious of that character just not coming through in the films, I, I just wonder why that hasn't happened. You know, I think, it's also, I, I got, the guys asked me to do a little Superman and Lex story that's included in the hardcover, which I had the pleasure of having, working with Neil Adams on. It's amazing. Um, and the story centers around the idea that because Lex is such, such a representative of what is strong in the human race, as well as what went wrong, Superman doesn't want to defeat him, he wants to win him over on some level. And it's just a little story of Superman going to play chess with Lex Luthor because he keeps hoping that if he just sits down and shows Lex the right way to think, that there'll be some way to get through to him, convince him that Superman is not, um, not a bad thing for the world, but also have Lex be a good part of the world and like Superman make the choice to use his personal gifts, his personal abilities for the right causes. Um, Thank it doesn't you. necessarily work out as Superman intended, but. Next question. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, thanks a lot. I really can't say how much I've uh, enjoyed your, both of your work over the years, in particular Mr. Levitt's The Great Dart and the Saga. I'm just geeking out here. I was in college at the time, and it was Thank something you. to be able to take 20 minutes and get a break from college to just go into a whole other different world. <laughs> um, and that said, um, this is, I guess in a few days is the 60th anniversary of the Legion of Superheroes. Um, and I'm just curious, one of the ways that I've always enjoyed Superman is the interaction with other characters. And I don't know if either of you have something that you'd like to share about that. In the character. 
I think it's always fun. Uh, part of it is that whenever we put characters like that together, we find out what makes them different from one another. And it's that character mix. And some of them can be quite special. I mean, obviously, there's always been the Superman-Batman dynamic. More recently, the Superman-Wonder Woman dynamic. Um, certainly with the Legion, where Superboy was flat out the inspiration for them right. to exist, that's sort of like the ultimate combination of, of characters there. So, And that's the first stuff we got to do together. Yeah. Towards the beginning of your career as a career as an artist, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, I agree completely with what Dan said. The other thing that I think that's key on that is when you put Superman among the other heroes, you really see his iconic nature because he's fundamentally different from the rest of them. There are many other heroes that have incredible powers, but in this mythology, he's the primal figure and you see people reacting to him that way. And it's kind of, if Thomas Jefferson showed up here and wanted to go digging through some of the books in the library, it would be a very different reaction than the most impressive politician <coughs> that you could possibly find in Washington today showing up and wanting to do that yeah. research. Hi, uh, thank you both. Uh, this has been a really awesome event. Uh, I, uh, I love Superman a lot, and uh, it's awesome to talk uh, about the Man of Steel. Um, I actually want to dig a little, be uh, a little deeper into the Batman-Superman relationship specifically. There have been a lot of different interpretations based on, uh, you know, you can find something where they're flat out enemies, you can find things where they're frenemies, you can find things where they're best of friends, you can find things where there's a trust but verify relationship between the two of them. And so I'm, I'm interested, how do you both view that relationship? Should there be some antagonism? Should there be some tension? Or is that just something that <coughs> is, is, is almost like a relic, and should that be disposed of to tell new stories about Batman and Superman and that relationship? I, I have never approached it as though they're the best of buddies. I, I think there is an incredible amount of mutual respect on both sides, but fundamentally, I think they operate in very different ways. And because they operate in very different ways, it's not as though Superman categorically approves, um, doesn't mean he disapproves, but I think there's always, I think it's better when there's some tension there. Uh, you know, Batman is a creature of the night, Superman is of the sun, uh, Batman wears the mask, Superman does not, all that stuff, it, it's there as a difference, but those differences mean something. And I always think it's been a little, you know, forced just to say, because they were in a title for so long that was called World's Finest Comics that they have to be the best of buddies. I just, they, they seem too different than that to me. And yeah, opposites attract, but I still think they're too different from one another. Yeah, I think, I agree with what you're saying, Dan. I just don't think they'd be comfortable with each other. Right. I mean, I, there's got to be a part of Batman that looks and says, Jesus, if I had those powers, I would just destroy every gun in Gotham City in one night. I'd run from building to building to building doing this. The things I would be able to accomplish with it. And Superman, at the same time, would look at the methodology Batman uses, the emphasis on fear, and be turned off. It would be something he'd just be totally uncomfortable with on, yep. on some very basic level. Um, it's challenging writing anything like Justice League because you bring the together characters who have such fundamentally different points of view. On one level, it's great because you really, as Dan was saying, you get to show the, the conflict points between them that, mm -hmm. that, that heighten the relationships. And we recognize it as people. It's no different than the relationships we see in members of a sports team who are brought together for the same goal, but you know, one of them's a show-off and the other one's a great team player. Mm -hmm and one of them's always thinking about what the next play might be and talking to the coach and outthinking them. Um, so it's very, very human and recognizable, but it's very challenging to 
put that together and say, would they stay together? Would they, would they play nicely together? Hey, Professor, how are you? It's been a while. It's Andrew Davis. Hello there. So my question is piggying back off of the Batman question I was just asked. So Nightfall came out and Death of Superman came out relatively close to each other. How were you two feeling when those two books came out and what was going through your head on them competing with each other or not competing with each other? Mostly it was, oh my God, we're selling so many comics. <laughs> I mean, there, was, there were some good days. <laughs> there was a period there of about six months or a year where we were having weekly meetings to figure out how to keep some of these things in print because it was just moving through so quickly. And it was a phenomenal moment. Um, you know, the success of Death of Superman, which was really the, the extraordinary thing, Nightfall was successful, but nowhere near in the same league, um, was not anything we were anticipating. We'd killed Superman before. We'd killed him a couple of different ways. We'd killed him different times. Nobody, they were nice stories. You can argue that the Jerry Siegel version of killing Superman in the 60s was one of the best Superman stories of the 1960s. But ultimately, in the grand scheme of things, nobody cared. Um, the run that Dan worked on with Mike Carlin and the whole rest of the team, whether it was because it first hit on, the news of it first hit on a slow news day, or the zeitgeist of the world had changed, a bunch of things came together, and we were just standing there with a basket catching manna from heaven for a while. <laughs> um, you know, they, this was the very early days of doing any kind of graphic novel format, trade paperback or anything. And we wanted to do a one-volume edition of the first death story. We had sold so many copies of the individual, so many printings. I remember very vividly the guys who handled the newsstand side of our business, the mass market distribution, coming in. And they wanted copies of this one-volume trade paperback we were doing. Well, that was a returnable business. So the more copies you printed for it, the more risk you were taking. And the normal print run that you would do for sending something to the newsstand in comics at that point might have been 50,000 or 100,000 copies at, at most of something. And usually it was a comic book that was a, probably at that time a, a, dollar, a dollar comic or a 75 cent comic. So you know, the cost of print wasn't very much. It wasn't an enormous risk to put it out there. And we said, all right, you know, look and see how many you think you can move through the newsstands. We'll take a look. And they came back and said, okay, we need 650,000. <laughs> and this was 395, I think, for the first version? It was 495. 495? And, and right before Christmas, too, right? Sounds about right. I, I, yeah, and, and uh, that's what was really a miracle is the speed with and, which you pulled it together. You know, normally speaking, you would expect, if you were successful for something like that, to sell half of the copies you ship, maybe one-third of the copies, and the rest would come back and be dead trees. Um, and, but you also might get all of them back. And we hadn't sent out 600,000 of anything to the newsstand for, God, 20 years at that point. Uh, but we had made enough money off the periodical copies that we said, OK, you know, we can afford to gamble this this year. And we printed the, the 650,000 or whatever it was, and we sent it out. And they all sold. It was just, it was an amazing year. We've got time for one more question. It's got to be really good. <laughs> um, did you get to pick um, Doomsday, who got the death of Superman, or did DC pick? Help me out. What about picking the death of Superman? Who, did we? Um, did you get to pick Doomsday, or did DC pick Doomsday? Well, uh. we decided to do the death of Superman, right? And, and actually, I had two stories written on a, or two ideas written on a yellow legal pad. One was death of Superman, and the other one was Monster Trashes Metropolis. 
And then on another sheet, right under that one, I had a little sketch of a monster with some bones sort of sticking out of him. And this was on a yellow legal pad. We started talking about a story called The Death of Superman. And when I say we, we were several writers and artists in our editorial team all in the room together. And we, we started to focus on it and thought that would work out. But we still didn't have a name for the monster or anything else. And our editor wrote Doomsday for Superman at the top of the board. Hmm. And we then said, wait. Because back then, everybody had crazy names. And you know, it was blood this and blood that in a lot of ways. And someone, I, and I think it was me, but I'm not 100% sure, said, is there anybody called Doomsday? And we all start, Doomsday, Doomsday. No, there's not. So we, that's how he got the name Doomsday, and I had a little sketch right there. So we sort of picked it, but then because we had an editor in the room, DC went for it. <laughs> was that a Tarrytown house? Was that? Tarry, Tarrytown house? No, that came later. Okay. I think that, that was like a meeting or two later, I believe. Well, the two of you were nice enough to, we actually have one of the first copies of the celebration of 80 years uh, Action Comics. This isn't the periodical. This is actually the collection that Paul edited and put together. Because remember, there are two, two versions coming out. Uh, you guys have signed this copy for the Library of Congress, so thank mm -hmm. you very much. So uh, on behalf of everyone here and uh, Paul and Dan, we'd like to thank you all for coming out to this very fun conversation. Uh, gentlemen, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you all. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.